Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Katherine Schultz in conversation with Casey Sepp and David Remnick to discuss Lost and Found, a memoir published by our friends at Random House. We're so lucky to have you with us tonight, and we're so excited about this book, which is just out into the world tomorrow. Katherine Schultz is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Being Wrong. She won a National Magazine Award and a Pulitzer Prize for the really big one, her article about seismic risk in the Pacific Northwest. Lost and Found grew out of Losing Streak, a New Yorker story that was anthologized in Best American Essays. Welcome, Catherine. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Casey Sepp, a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee, which was a New York Times bestseller and named one of the best books of 2019. Welcome, Casey, and thanks for joining us. Also on board to moderate tonight is David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker since 1998 and a staff writer since 1992. Under Remnick's leadership, The New Yorker has become the country's most honored magazine. Welcome, David. Just a quick reminder to the audience that you can post your questions below in the Ask a Question feature and please order your copy of Lost and Found from Books and Books and support indie bookstores. And now, without further ado, let's get this conversation started. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. I, I must tell you, Catherine and, and Casey, um, I, I wish I was with you and not only to get a tour of the house and meet the baby, but also to see you. It's been too, too long, too, too long. Amen. So I, I wanted to start with this. Catherine, you've written about a lot of things over time. Um, to write a memoir about family is a very particular thing. You know the old saw that Czeslaw Milos, the Polish poet, once said that when a writer comes into a family, there goes the family. <laughs> and um, what are the rules that you set down for yourself? You, once you're writing about your father's death, about grief, and at the same time, you're writing about falling in love um, with the person next to you as it happens. Um, <laughs> what are the rules? How do you go about conceiving a book like that? Um, in terms of its uh, depths and honesty and where you will go and where you won't? That is a terrific question. Um, it probably speaks very poorly of me that I've never thought about the answer before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, first of all, I feel very fortunate in that um, I didn't have to worry so much about rules going into this book because, um, as is quite obvious from the book, I'm actually writing about two incredibly happy and loving families. Um, three, really, the one I've made, the one I came from, uh, and the one that Casey came from. And, you know, I, I think a lot of contemporary memoir um, is grappling, importantly so, with, um, with trauma or with difficulty or with celebrity or with the kinds of things that in all sorts of ways can divide a family or, or, or reveal divisions that are already in a family. Um, I was actually writing about a lot of joy, grief, of course, but a lot of joy. And so it didn't really feel like there was much in the way of minefields around that. Um, I did, um, you know, I was mindful that I don't think Casey ever anticipated that I would write a memoir. I frankly never anticipated that I would write a memoir. Um, and, you know, you worry more about, I don't really, I mean, for one thing, I'm an extrovert. For another thing, I'm in control of my prose. I don't really care what I, I, I deeply care what I put there, put out about myself, but I'm, you know, completely in charge of it. And um, I was mindful that I was writing about two people who I love very much. And to be honest, you know, I, I hope people love this book, but I really, really hope people love the two main characters in this book because I do very much. And so I, I felt strongly about presenting them honestly, uh, which conveniently for me meant glowingly and, and lovingly. So 
Boy, I don't know. I feel like that's a, I'm not actually trying to dodge the question, but I, you know, when I, when I first shop this book around, you know, you go and you talk about you, when you want to write with a bunch of publishers and one of them very earnestly at the end of that conversation was kind of trying to gently ask me a question that I, I couldn't figure out the nature of it. And at some point it became very clear to me that what he was asking was, if we buy this book, are we going to be sued? <laughs> <laughs> your family in general say again by casey or by, by your family no, or by general? anyone who knows right the you know the uncle the parents the disillusioned uh -huh. stepbrother you know this kind of thing um, i'm very happy to report that i was never worried about getting sued for writing this book which might be why i, I didn't think very deeply about kind of ground rules about what to say or not to say i've got to tell you i it, it's interesting that even very great writers become known by you know, remarks that they make um, that turn out to be absolute nonsense. One of them is F. Scott Fitzgerald's, there are no second acts in American lives, but we see second acts all the time. And the other is Tolstoy's line that begins, Anna Karenina, that all happy families are, 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 are alike, at, which also seems to be pure nonsense. I, I wonder, as your father was in his decline, um, and in the days thereafter, did it occur to you that you were writing a book or beginning to write a book in your head or that you might? Um, you know, not while he was dying, I don't think, but certainly um, very soon thereafter. You know, it's a it's a very strange thing. Um, you must know this from, you know, all your years at the magazine, someone has a vague idea that people keep saying, well, is that piece ever going to happen? Is that piece ever going to happen? And 10 years later, lo and behold, that piece happens. Well, funnily enough, for years, I'd kind of wanted to write about losing things. For so long, I can't even remember the origins of why this particular idea kind of lodged in my head. But I was interested in the range of things we lose and how strange and eclectic of a category it is. And just never got around to it in that way that, you know, a lot of good ideas just kind of wither on the vine. Um, and I will say that very soon after my father died, I thought, oh my God, that's that's that piece. That's why I haven't been able to write it and, and why I can now, because now it has it has a story and it has gravitas and it has a, a lot of emotion uh, and, and it has a kind of organizing principle that makes this category what it really is, which is which is existential. Are there any books that are models for what you were trying to get at? You know, not exactly. I mean, I, I read, um, I was pretty underread in the realm of memoir when I started on this. And um, I did do some reading, I think, not exactly as a model, but as kind of a spur. Um, I really love uh, C.S. Lewis as a grief observed, a very slim, very beautiful, truly heartbreaking book about the death of his wife. And I've always had a kind of um, fraught relationship with it because it's beautiful and it does a lot of what I think a book should do. It also in some ways is absolutely alien to me because he was a devout Christian and part of his process of grieving was a process of wrestling with God and, and trying to understand, you know, why this kind of suffering could, could exist in his life. And so, you know, to some extent I was interested in in trying to write the secular version of that. You know, how do you how do you think about grief and and how do you think about annihilation or, or, or the end of selfhood and consciousness if, if you don't have this kind of ground floor of a faith in an afterlife. So that was some of what I was doing. But, um, you know, David, I often just kind of wander into the thicket of whatever idea I think I'm pursuing absolutely without guide, which is almost always a terrible idea and means it takes like 20 times as long as it should. But um, but certainly, you know, Lewis and a handful of great uh, memoirs were sort of guides along the way, belatedly. <laughs> Casey, what is the timing of things? Um, Catherine, your father died when and when did you meet and how, how did these these two events coincide? You can feel that. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, my father died. Um, so I, Casey and I met in May of 2015 um, and my father died in September of 2016. So effectively, I feel like we sort of got... Um, we got kind of one chance at everything. You know, we got one birthday and one anniversary and one Hanukkah and one new year. And then, and that, that was that. And Casey, did you have any sense that you were um, going to be a character in a book? 
you feel like a character in a book as well as a human being in a very real relationship. I always feel like a character in something. Um, no, if I had thought about it, I probably would have asked for a prenuptial agreement and, you know, made sure that it would happen. Um, you know, she was not known as a memoir writer. She was, you know, known unto me and unto many people as an incredibly gifted critic and essayist and reporter. And, you know, I guess I had met Catherine Schultz, the critic on the page. You quoted Fitzgerald. I don't know if you're on my team or Catherine's, but one of the first things I read by her was a um, kind of cantankerous piece about why The Great Gatsby is not, in fact, a good book. And um, I took it very personally. And I thought, you know, who was New York Magazine hired to be their book critic? And how could that person possibly think so little of one of the great American novels? And then I went and clicked through and read, you know, she'd written this beautiful piece about Frost and that was very good and troubling because I thought these two incongruous things, she's idiotic on Gatsby, but brilliant on Frost. And, so you're, you're, and Casey, you're absolutely right. You, yeah, there you go. Thank you, David. Thank yeah. you, David. That, I heard as a moderator. <laughs> you know, the tit for tat of that prenuptial agreement might've been, I'll be a character if you, you know, retract your views on Gatsby. But, yeah. um, no, in any event, I, I had no idea. And I, I think what's beautiful and wonderful is um, Catherine really didn't either. You know, we talked about early on when we were dating things we wanted to write, places we wanted to write about. I've always wanted to write about the Eastern Shore more. And so I was quite touched by the way she does it in this book. I wanted to write something about my father and that meteorite. It's a story I've told a thousand times and I just can't imagine doing as good a job with it as Catherine did. So there's a lot about the book. Wait, 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 wait a minute though, okay, Casey, you're being very generous here. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Over, over the breakfast table say, the meteorite story, that's mine, not No, yours. no, no. I mean, it's, it's really the opposite of, um, I think it's the opposite of the impulse most of us have as writers. I think Catherine is just truly one of the most gifted writers I know, and there's nothing I wouldn't rather read her version of um, than than write my own, including including Daddy's story. So I was I was really touched, and um, so was he. And you know, I think if he could, he'd like be logged on right now, also holding forth <laughs> on how wonderful that story is, and you know what a wonderful childhood he had. But no, I had no idea. Um, and I think when Catherine, I was surprised you didn't say this, when her father passed, she sat down and wrote his obituary right away. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a beautiful obituary for him. And, you know, she said to me, it's the first thing I've ever written that he hasn't read. And, um, you know, I wonder what the next thing will be. And I remember saying, I know you're going to write something beautiful about him that's not just an obituary. So I think, you know, we I, I saw the book coming then, even if I didn't see it coming when we first met. Um, but, you know, now I'm like, it's the opposite impulse of every kind of private impulse I have of like, I want to read her on our daughter. I want to read her on bedtime and bedtime stories and bath time. And I just think she is so gifted at turning the world into words. There's kind of nothing I wouldn't want to read her on, including me. As embarrassing and humiliating as it is, you know. Well, I should remember when she said she was going to write about the worst fight we ever had, which is probably the closest thing to a divorce. We've like, I was like, really? You think you want to write about that? And then even that turns out to be kind of well done in the book. And okay, okay. it's, it's early days. I'm married 34 years. So <laughs> ah, there you go. I well, know, yeah, you're 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 a practitioner of marriage. You're a fan. I feel like she's she's heard from some people who aren't. Who but you know? I, I, I may be a practitioner of marriage, but not of memoir writing. So draw your own conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, remember yeah. Jeffrey Wolf, Jeffrey Wolf, Jeffrey Wolf and Toby Wolf, Tobias Wolf, brothers, um, wrote this the same book about the same man, and it was a radically different man. Their father, in Jeffrey Wolf's book, he's a complete grifter, and then in Toby Wolf's book, you're you're reading from the the poverty side of their relationship. Is it possible? Um, Casey, I know you're, you're, you know, so far in your career, you've been devoted to two things in particular, which is criticism as well, but also heavily reported narrative writing. Would you ever see yourself writing about some of the same territory, your relationship? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. I have no doubt, you know, the, the multiple versions of any given story are appealing. It's actually one of the reasons I love memoir. 
you know, I love to read the autobiographies of people who you can then go read the biographies of and compare and, you know, these sort of projects of reading around, you know, the Bloomsbury group or something, and you can go read each of them on the others. And, you know, the constellation fills out and gets more complicated and you form your own opinion of someone. So, um, no, I, I participated in the fact checking of this book. So I, I feel like I, I got to have my say about a few things. And even when the magazine ran the excerpt from it, um, you know, little little things here and there. But no, I, I think Catherine has laid claim to it. You know, it's like Melville and the whale. There's nothing left to say. Just just let the best version of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to come and do it again. Yeah, I guess that guy Philbrick came along after Melville. Right? Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Phil, Philbrick to Catherine's Melville. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any concern about that. You, you share a lot about your father and Casey and your extended family, but an interesting way for in, in a memoir, you don't say that much about yourself by comparison. So tell us a little bit about you. What you know, your life, you know, who are you as a, as a writer that comes to write a memoir? Mm. I'll, be, I'll be standing on one foot while you answer this question. As they say, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's true. That is kind of the, um, the, the deep trick of this memoir. It's actually not that much about me. Right? I'm not very interested in myself. I find Casey endlessly fascinating. My father was an incredible human being. Um, Casey's family is all very interesting. People in general are interesting, but I'm not that interesting. Um, so I'm in it to the extent that it's necessary to make sense of the narrative, uh, but it's, it's not about kind of plumbing my inmost soul. Um, but David, for you, I'll, I'll tell you anything. What, what would you like to know about me? How, how did you decide to become a writer what, and instead of making an honest living and um, doing something else? You know, I am one of these very lucky people who I, I barely feel like I decided. I cannot remember a time in my life when this wasn't what I loved. Um, I think when I was younger, I thought I might write fiction, which turned out to be the world's most terrible idea. Um, I'm, I'm just awful at it. I don't, I admire people who have that gear and can also write nonfiction. I don't have that gear at all. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it's so funny. There's a, there's a section in this book when um, Casey and my sister and I are, are cleaning out my parents' house in anticipation of um, moving them into a into a condo and they had lived in that house for, you know, 30 some years. And um, God bless my mother, who I believe is probably watching tonight and is uh, as wonderful as my father. And it's kind of a shame that we only write these payons after people can no longer read them. But um, my mom, you know, possibly aware that um, her daughter wanted to be a writer or, or possibly just charmingly proud of her kids. I swear to you saved every single thing I ever wrote in my entire life. And so, you know, you can go back and read these like, efforts of figuring out how, you know, narrative works or poetry works or, uh, you know, or frankly, like book reviews works dating to when I'm like eight years old and they're hideously embarrassing, but, um, but it certainly made it easy in the sense that um, I didn't know how to become a writer, but I, I knew, I knew it's what I wanted to do. You and I are going to tell about the crown of you. Oh my God. This is the problem with doing a show with, you know, someone who knows all your dirty secrets. Yes. In, in, um, in the fifth grade, I wrote, um, a trilogy. The first volume was 310 pages. Um, that was, you know, David, I don't know if you remember, but the first piece I ever wrote for your magazine was, um, or no, the first piece I ever wrote as a staff writer was a review of Helen McDonald's fabulous, uh -huh. fabulous H's for Hawk. It's actually a stellar example of a memoir that's doing really, really interesting things. Um, part of that memoir is actually about T.H. White, who also tried to tame, to tame a goshawk or train, I guess one doesn't tame them. Uh, well, I was obsessed with T.H. White as a young child. Um, and in fact, obsessed with all things vaguely, you know, medieval, King Arthur, Camelot, this kind of nonsense. Um, I say nonsense, I still love it in my heart of hearts. So I wrote, um, yes, in the fifth and sixth grade, I wrote I wrote a three volume uh, kind of knockoff, Once in Future King, regrettably titled The Crown of Eve. Um, <laughs> Which uh, it cannot be, can never see the light of day, and I cannot believe I have confessed to it in this conversation. You know, there's a hole, there's a hole in our C issue. You can probably <laughs> send it in. We'll just, we'll just winch it down a little bit and fit, put it in the New Yorker. Um, so you decide to, you didn't really decide to become a writer. It wasn't like it's not like flipping a switch or going to law school or or anything else. Um, 
I, I have to say I'm endlessly fascinated. It's not like you're the first couple in the history of um, New New Yorker. In fact, there's a couple still roaming right, for example, um, well, I won't even say who they are, so they'll, they'll announce themselves in time. Um, <laughs> but I've always wondered, because I I just don't know how it works, how the Eastern Shore Bureau uh, of the New Yorker functions. In other words, do you show each other manuscripts? Did you hold back this book until the very end, or were you showing bits to Casey along the way? How does that work? You want to answer that? Go ahead. Uh, how does it work? Um, it's delightful. I think um, it's uh, Casey has reformed me in many, many ways, uh, and and one of them is, you know, in my pre Casey life, I was one of these classically uh, insanely angsty writers. You know, I would stay up basically all night, four nights in a row, and be dysfunctional and miss deadlines. I still occasionally, but no, to miss deadlines, but less dysfunctionally in the run up to that, <laughs> um, and. It was incredible to meet Casey because it, I just suddenly had an example of a perfectly calm and happy writer who just sits down and does it with great delight and who took one look at me. She was kind of patient, like the first two pieces she watched me write. And then she was like, you're not upset about this piece. There's nothing wrong with this piece. You're insanely sleep deprived and you haven't eaten in three days. Like go to bed <laughs> and, and learn to write functionally. So it's been very good for me as a writer. Um, and yes, we, we show each other everything, I would say including this book all along the way. And how critical do you allow yourself to be with each other's manuscripts in, in, in progress? He said, is a leading question. <laughs> that Casey, one. Casey, why don't you answer that one? Yeah, well, one of the things I learned really early on about Catherine is, you know, she has incredible talents as a critic, but um, the, the first kind of three versions of anything she writes, all she wants to hear is that it's wonderful and I wouldn't change a word. <laughs> Um, which I learned the hard way by changing every other word in the draft of something only to be met by, I think, tears and I think maybe like, you know, a brief separation. Yes. And, you now, know. now we're in the realm of hyperbole. But yeah. yes. In any event, um, no, I, I think now we, you know, we, we talk about pieces before we sit down to write them. Sometimes we talk before one of us interviews someone and, you know, really the delight of our days is we are able to spend a lot of time with each other and a lot of time with each other's ideas. And so by the time it's on the page, I feel like we're both pretty well acquainted with each other's work. It's kind of a delight now with the baby, we spend a little more time apart. We kind of spell each other during the day. So there's the opportunity for prose to happen that the other doesn't know about. You know, half a draft might arrive because you've written it in three wakeful windows mm -hmm. while she's, you know, being taken care of by the other mother. Well, well, Casey, let me ask about that. Is it uh, uh, an essay long ago by Cyril Connolly, or kind of a long essay called this, The Enemies of Promise. And the enemy of promise, number one, is the, what he called the pram in the hallway. Meaning <laughs> what he was advising was, you know, you have little kids, you have babies, and they yeah. take up a lot of space in your life. I sure. get, I don't think I'm betraying any terrible secrets. I get from Catherine and you delightful photographs of your <laughs> child, who's the, of the most beautiful child, um, serene, smiling, um, beyond beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but what's the effect on the writing life? I hope you're also going to share. You get draft after draft. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we had a pretty busy parental leave. Um, but I hear you. And I, I think what's interesting is I, I was not meant as crit criticism at all. In fact, yeah, to, yeah. Be told to the, to the, to the Miami book fair people that, um, I just received on time, a wonderful <laughs> essay from Catherine on Bambi. Oh, the <laughs> state it's true. It's true. That Bambi piece is really great. Um, although obviously, I mean, how does having a child influence you? I think we both thought we were going to sob when we watched Bambi again and thought about <laughs> our daughter without us, but um, which, you know, says more about us than her. But no, look, I, I think we're really blessed. My family lives nearby. We have a lot of help. Um, we have great health care. We're financially stable. I think a lot of the things that drain a lot of other families um, are, you know, just really that we're not burdened by them. Um, we're, we're burdened by the things that burden all parents, which is an insatiable appetite for her and a devotion to her that I think, you know, whether or not the pram was in the hallway, the baby's on my mind. And I think that's true for Catherine too. But I think in really beautiful ways, um, you know, her presence is 
humanizing and humbling and intellectually challenging um, in ways that I hope really do shape our work. I'm a lot more patient. Um, you know, I think I used to spend a couple of minutes on every sentence, but you know, the first 20 minutes of any nap time, all I can do is look at her and think of a sentence. And so I take more yeah. time with them and, um, you know, think over things more carefully. And um, I think in that way, she really has changed this. I'm much more curious about how other, talk about biography or an interest in memoir. I am absolutely fascinated by the question of who she is and when she becomes that person and what influence we have on it. And I was interested in psychology and human development before her, but it's an absolutely extraordinary front row seat for that. Um, yeah. And I think in that way, even if it makes us a little slower to turn in drafts, I, I think it'll make us better thinkers and, um, you know, better people. I just, I remember interviewing, I did this piece for the magazine, this profile of Marilyn Robinson, this novelist we both love. And, um, you know, I remember talking to her about her children and I, I presented her with this question, which was the pram in the hallway, you know, motherhood, obviously your students ask you about how it ruins their careers. And, you know, what do you tell them? And, you know, she just, brush the question away as if it were, you know, the, the silliest thing she'd ever heard and said, you know, to encounter another consciousness coming into being is the most extraordinary training you can have as a writer. True for a nonfiction writer too. You know, I, I think it should give us new insight into other people and an appetite and a curiosity for other people. So I don't know, but you should say you love her too. This makes it seem like <laughs> only in all of my time. I, I, I am not. I am not alone in my you know worship of our of our. I didn't think you were. I didn't think yeah. you were. Well, I'm not alone in in somehow you know balancing things. I think Casey actually turned in a a piece on of all things the Pharaoh. We learned it's actually said Tutankhamun. <laughs> Uh, on the same day, I turned in that Bambi piece, which was about very odd subject matters floating around our house. But yeah, I mean, look, is it um, is it harder? Is there is life busier suddenly? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, I don't actually recommend closing a magazine piece, publishing a book, and having a five month old all at the exact same time. Um, but uh, but no, I, I I would just echo what Casey said, which is it just so self evidently feels first of all, like the absolute priority it needs to be. And second of all, like it is just um, a deep, deep, deep grounding in the human experience, which it seems to me you, you do need to have to write well about, frankly, almost anything. Um, I want, Casey, I wanted to ask you, and it will ask you both the memoir question. You mentioned one or, one or two earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think people, there came a rash of, I don't mean that in a, you know, in a dermatological <laughs> sense, <laughs> um, but 15 or so years ago, memoirs in American literature became um, more present, I would say, you know, whether it was Mary Carr or it was just a whole hell of a lot of them, Lucy Greeley, um, just a lot. Are there ones that you treasure above all, not as models for, you, for your book, Catherine, or for your work, Casey, but just as, you know, if you could drag someone by the collar who maybe watching this and say, read these memoirs um, that you may or may not have heard of, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think memoir is extraordinary. And Catherine and I talk a lot, we love history, but I, I think, you know, the memoir, the biography, it's the atom of human history, right? Individual humans telling their stories and then putting them in conversation with one another. I, I think it's wonderful. Now, I know what you mean, the kind of contemporary version is sometimes a little more inward and solipsistic and um, not quite as political as the kind of genre I'm most drawn to. So I think, you know, look, Catherine writes about the Eastern Shore beautifully in her book, but I think if, if folks watching have not read Frederick Douglass's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, you know, that is a memoir, that is an autobiography, but it is a slave narrative. It is political and savvy and uses one story to launch a hugely influential argument about freedom and citizenship and what it means to be self-made. And, you know, it's, it's, it feels like an emaciated term in some ways today, but that's a memoir and a really beautiful one. So that's high on my list. I love it because, you know, it, it's the Eastern shore geography too. And for me growing up was suddenly, you know, a very different look at this place that I love and the agricultural and rural history that felt 
you know, bu bucolic and innocent to me was, was suddenly obviously not. You know, it is the story of enslavement, the brutal enslavement of someone on some of the very roads that I was riding my bike on and, and coming up in. And so I'd recommend that one. And then I think we're alike in our love of the confessions, which again, when you broaden the category of memoir and it becomes an apologia for a faith, you know, a philosophy of living and dying, you know, there's, there's Augustine doing incredible things with one human story. And I think, I mean, Catherine doesn't, doesn't share my faith, but I think she shares my love of the confessions. It's true. Although yeah. I have to say, you know, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know how she regards them. I regard them as, you know, fine and inspiring and a kind of template for conversion, but I don't have the sense that there was any kind of converting that happened yeah. when she, yeah. It's not my relationship, but I will say, um, you know, a, a dear mutual friend of ours, and, and actually David, I think your newest staff writer, um, Paul Sagel once said this wonderful thing about Casey that she's quote all depth, um, which which is actually true and, and part of what I fell in love with. And I'm about to reveal my like extensive shallows. So um, I, I mentioned earlier- what you read. He said, what, no, no, what would you I'm recommend? Gonna say, I'm, I'm gonna say, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I was pretty underread in the genre of memoir when I sat down to write one. And so out of a, a sense of, you know, compunction and responsibility, I, I sat down and read all of these kind of blockbuster memoirs I had completely missed. And I have to say like, Eat, Pray, Love, The Glass oh, yeah. Castle, Liars Club, I demolished them. They're all great. They're incredibly fun. They're really interesting. Um, they're in actually every case in, in very different ways, it's wonderfully written and, and totally delightful. So it's it's very alien to my life in a lot of ways, but I really, and I, I do think there's some limits um, in the kind of inwardness, or I think the I think the intrinsic risk of memoir is a little bit too much inwardness uh, and, and not attentiveness to, history and, and politics and the kind of grand sweep of things in the way Casey is describing. But um, looking for said, inspiration, we're actually right in front of our biographies and memoirs. Oh, that's true. So you just said Lucy Greeley, I see autobiography of a face on there, but then I'm also looking at the Ann Patchett to go with it. So, you know, I think we could come up with a real list in a few minutes. <laughs> your, books are, your books are much better organized than mine. Um, <laughs> My, mine were in piles and boxes and garbage bags and Catherine alphabetized them and, you know, came up after my own heart, garbage bags. That's a, that's a, that's a good organizing system. You've got Absolutely. The biographies over here. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, so I, I want to ask, relay some questions from, from the audience who've sent some really terrific ones. Um, I think I'm not supposed to give the name, so you'll forgive me if if, if you expected me to. You, you spend a, a lot of time considering the emotional and psychological components of both losing and finding. I'm interested in the threads of material culture woven throughout the Thanksgiving chair, your father's wallet that now lives in your dresser, a book of poetry left open on the table after your first date. How do material things inform your understanding of memory and emotion. Wow, thing. I mean, I wish you would read the name because that's an incredibly sophisticated and surprising question. Uh, uh, and interestingly, something I, um, well, I would say I haven't thought about it all, but apparently I was thinking about it in the writing of this book. Um, you know, I think a really interesting thing about intense emotion is that it does inhere in really specific things, right? I mean, it, it, there's a strange way that the physical world around us um, absorbs in a kind of, you know, nuclear fallout way, although sometimes in, in the beautiful version of that, um, it, it absorbs the the emotion of the moment. And um, there's no question that after my dad died, there were um, physical objects that, that had a kind of power on me. I mean, I really will never ever forget just sitting with the pile of his uh, button down shirts that we had set aside to donate after his death. And it just somehow, um, just it just absolutely undid me. You know, my uh, my I, I, they were so literally empty of him, you know, and and yet so easily to, easy to kind of fill back up with him. You know, you picture your dad going off to work every day as a kid, and you have this real sense of how he dresses for work, how he dresses on the weekends, how he dresses on vacation. And um, yes, I, I think the objects around us are powerful. It's it's a really interesting observation about the book because, um, you know, on the one hand, as, as Casey just disclosed, I'm like low level obsessive about the material world. Like I'm, you know, I organize it and I tidy it and this kind of thing, but um, I'm not, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't describe myself as overly attached to it. And yes, yet um, I, I think the questioner is absolutely right. Like we reflect enormous amounts of emotion in, into the physical world around us. It's another wonderful question um, being asked from the audience out there. The poet Alan Tate, not a poet that gets quoted very much anymore, but the poet Alan Tate um, tried to write a memoir, but gave up because he said that to write the truth about others he would have to write the truth about himself. Talk about the, um, and I guess to elaborate on that question, talk about what you are confronted with when you are confronted with this um, task of writing truthfully about um, mm. others and your and yourself. Mm. It's really interesting. Um, I will be honest, I think I dodge that task in some sense, not because I'm dishonest uh, or coy about myself or, or for that matter about other people in this book, but you know, we're talking about it in the language of memoir and there's no question that's absolutely right. I literally tell my love story, I tell my grief story, um, but I, I don't think I ever would have sat down and, and just written those stories. You know, I was motivated to write this book because um, you know, for whatever reason, the way my mind works is I'm, I'm drawn to these abstract categories of experience. You know, my last book was was about the experience of being wrong. And and truly what shaped this book was an interest in this very strange and capacious category of loss in general, right? Not just grief, but the whole shebang, you know, cell phones, elections, loved ones, you know, you name it. The number of things we've lost in this pandemic alone could fill up, you know, vast swap corners of that category. So I was interested in that and then interested in in the flip side in the um in the experience of discovery and and finding um whether that's a a, a new planet or a falling star or the person you're going to fall in love with. Um, and then and then the piece that binds in this very strange final part of the book. I mean I hope it's not ultimately that strange, but in the moment that I sat down to write it I thought, gosh, this might be strange. Um that, that's that's it's called and and it is about um kind of conjunction as a feature of, of human experience, emotional conjunction and experiential conjunction. So because I was so interested in these sort of slightly hidden but omnipresent categories of human experience, I, I to the extent that I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what's what's real and true and what matters here, it was, it was almost more about those abstractions. I mean, you know, I did, I did certainly, have to think about like, well, okay, how did I actually feel in these moments of grief? And um, it was really pleasurable to revisit falling in love and, and putting that on the page. But, you know, again, partly because, yes, I'm sorry, you know, I, I told story, I did come from a happy family and I, I revel in that in the book, but there wasn't, um, there wasn't a big wrestling match with what am I gonna disclose? And there also wasn't, um, there wasn't a sense that there was anything I had to turn away from, but that's partly because I was, so turn towards things that were actually much beyond my own life. This is a question that might, and I don't mean to be facetious, but it might fall into the category of time management. Um, where did you find the time? We're talking about Alan Tate instead of time management. <laughs> no, this is, I think, I think this, this person is trying to figure out how you pull this all off. Where did you find the time to write this while maintaining your job at the New Yorker, uh -huh. carrying on a love affair and having a baby? Well, the baby postdates the writing of the book, although not the publication thereof. Um, the magazine job is extraordinarily forgiving. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Henry Finder, <laughs> and many others. Much too forgiving, but you know, I, I look. I did take book leave to write this book. I'm not a superhero. Superhero. I can't do forty things at once. And unlike Casey, I'm not at all a fast writer. I'm actually kind of painfully slow. Um, so the, the real answer is I kind of cleared the decks. You know, we didn't have a kid yet. Um, and I did take time away from the magazine. I missed it terribly, but it was necessary. I was going to otherwise write, a, you know, semi-decent book and a bunch of semi-decent magazine articles. And that's not in anyone's interest. So um, yes, I, I, um, I am deeply not a multitasker. So the answer is I did one thing at once. It's a lovely question. I think I got a lot of precious ideas about losing from your first book that I read and love, Being Wrong, which mm -hmm. a book I really highly recommend. And that book had a, a lot on the experience of losing one's beliefs, including core beliefs that constitute one's identity. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know that that's a question so much as a comment, but I, I, I maybe talk about the link from being wrong to uh, lost and found. Yeah, I mean, it seems offhand like a rather, um, a rather you, you would need to be kind of like an expert in the long jump to get from one to the other. Uh, but, but there is some common ground. Um, Part of it being what I what I just said that I'm interested in these kind of abstract categories of experience, but um, but that's actually a really great question. Um, there is a kind of overlap in, in that, you know, some of the things we can lose are um, beliefs, faith, our sense of self, and those are also all the kinds of things we can find. Interestingly enough. Um, I was very committed to this not being a long book, which uh, as David can probably tell you, uh, and, and my immediate editor can certainly tell you, brevity is really not my forte. <laughs> so um, I, when I first wrote this book, there was a quite a long section in, in Found, in that second section of the book that was about finding oneself and, and what that would even mean. I mean, speaking of our friend Augustine, right, in the Confessions, um, I, I, you know, there's this kind of like 7,000 word philosophically, you know, heavy handed um, outtake that just sits on my laptop somewhere now. Uh, because, um, partly because I felt like, well, this is, I did want the book to be short and stay relatively focused um, and, Although finding oneself or losing oneself is a really ex interesting example of, of losing and finding it, it felt a little far afield um, and cluttering up the, the love story among other things. But uh, I actually, part of why I got rid of it is I felt like I had already done it and being wrong. And I, I was a little bored writing it in that way where sometimes you have to, you feel like you have to get through a swath of material to get to what you really want to. And that's usually a clue that like, no, actually you don't. <laughs> I, I think we have time for, for one more. Um... It's a lovely question. Since you wrote your father's beautiful obituary, could you please explain the significance of the reference to apricot soup? Ah, oh, gosh, it is a very sweet question. Uh, not what I ever expected to feel tonight. And I wish my sister and my niece were here to feel that, um, you know, having a daughter is an unbelievably joyful experience. And truly the only sad note in all of it is that my father did not get to meet her and she will never get to know her grandfather, although we certainly spend quite a lot of time um, already telling her about him. But uh, my father loved kids. He was an amazing father and he was an amazing grandfather. Um, he had four grandkids, you know, my sister actually, but my um, the littlest one, my niece Adele, uh, had a very sweet, she was quite young when she died. I um, might get it slightly wrong, but I want to say she was eight or nine, but they um, they already had a very sweet, very independent relationship. And they would, you know, my dad would call her up and they would talk on the phone. And it was so funny because, you know, when I was visiting either my dad or my niece, you would hear these peals of laughter. They just cracked each other up. And um, I'm very happy to say, I cannot explain the significance of apricot soup. It is in that uh, obituary for my father because my niece asked for it to be there. And it is the sweetest of all things you could ever have between a grandparent and a grandchild, which is a private joke. <laughs> Um, Casey, finally, what's your favorite bit in Catherine's book? Is there a passage, is there a, a, an episode that is just immediately leaps out at you? Gosh, I mean, I've, I should tread lightly because I think narratively she, she does a really interesting thing with it. So I won't say more than um, just it's the beginning of the section about when, when we met and we fell in love and it's the inspiration for the cover of Catherine's book, which David, I'm gonna take your cue and remind <laughs> buy it from books and books, but um, it's a falling star, it's a meteorite. And you know, in pure Catherine style, there's a fascinating and intellectually rich riff on meteorites and what goes on in outer space and where they fall and how they fall and why we find them and why we don't. But um, then there's a very, beautiful symmetry to that story and the symmetry, the, the, the last bit where it comes together is my favorite part of the book. Um, so I won't spoil it because I do think it manages to be in the realm of suspenseful in a book that doesn't much operate at the level of suspense, but that little bit of it does. So I won't spoil it, but um, that's my favorite part. Actually mine too. <laughs> well, the whole book is my favorite. I, I really oh. love this book and, and I really implore everybody watching and all your cousins, and all your friends, and all your second cousins, and all your relatives, and even your enemies. You can buy this book, and buy it at, at your local independent bookstore, and I just love doing this with you all, and um, I'll see you soon, I hope. I dearly hope to see you soon.
Yeah, thank you thanks, so much, David. David, us too. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you yeah. so much. And, you know, Books and Books uses the ampersand in our logo. And the ampersand means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. um, I love the and part of this book. Um, and all about the connections between things. And I hope that we will remain connected and that there will be some exper experiential conjunction <laughs> happening soon <laughs> with all of us in Miami. I congratulate you. Thank you so much for your time, for being with us, reminding everybody if you don't already, you know, if you haven't purchased the book, you can purchase it down here um, on the link and it'll be through Books and Books. And thank you so much for watching. I, and I'm going to shamelessly jump in just to interrupt to say um, we're so grateful to the independent bookstores for doing this. And, you know, the truth is in the Zoom era, you're not walking into their store and browsing. You're not looking, walking past a book and thinking, oh, I've always meant to buy that. And I know it's really easy to buy elsewhere because you're just sitting there on your computer anyway. But, you know, I don't care if it's my book, but please buy something from these folks. They're taking the effort to put these events together. They support us. They make our careers possible. And it would really mean the world um, to them, I'm sure, but certainly to us as writers, if you would support them tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, on that note, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Yeah, of course.